Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Saudara dan saudari sekalian Saya ingin memaklumkan pengenalan beberapa pembaikan Bagi memastikan buletin perangkaan bulanan Dan buletin suku tahunan Bank Negara Malaysia Memenuhi keperluan pengguna utama Antaranya termasuk rencana dan artikel khas Berkaitan dengan isu-isu semasa dan inisiatif pihak bank serta penggunaan lebih banyak infografik uh, yang saya tunjukkan uh, baru dan uh, infografik it's not because I'm one year into the job it's uh, some of the continuous things that we are doing to improve uh, the communication of our messages pada sidang akhbar ini, Bank Negara Malaysia dan Jabatan Perangkaan Malaysia akan menyampaikan taklimat mengenai prestasi pertumbuhan ekonomi negara pada suku pertama tahun 2017. Taklimat ini juga merangkumi perkembangan moneteri dan kewangan dan isu-isu semasa yang berkaitan dengan ekonomi dan kewangan. Ekonomi negara mencatatkan pertumbuhan yang lebih kukuh sebanyak 5.6% pada suku pertama dan terus disokong oleh permintaan dalam negeri. Ladies and gentlemen, the global economic activity expanded further in the first quarter of the year with growth becoming more synchronized across countries. In the advanced economies, there was sustained expansion in consumption accompanied by an increase in investment activity. This is an important development, especially since investment play a bigger role in driving global trade. Amid sustained strength in domestic demand, Asia has benefited from recovery in global demand. Domestic demand was supported by favorable labor market condition and infrastructure spending. The Malaysian economy recorded a robust growth of 5.6% in the first quarter of 2017. Growth was supported by strong performance of domestic demand. On the domestic front, private sector expenditure recorded a strong growth and remained as the main driver of performance. Public sector expenditure became more supportive of growth with expansion in both consumption and investment. Exports provided additional impetus to growth, driven by broad-based increase in external demand for Malaysia's manufactured products and commodities. On the supply side, most economic sectors expanded at a faster pace. The improvement was mostly contributed by the turnaround in the agriculture sector amid higher growth in the services and manufacturing sectors. Growth in the agriculture sector rebounded as oil palm oil yields recovered from the negative impact of El Nino. The performance of the sector was also supported by a robust expansion in rubber production. Manufacturing sector growth was driven mainly by the electronics and electrical segment in line with the continued favorable global demand for semiconductors, growth was also stronger in the consumer-related segment, particularly due to a rebound in motor vehicle production. The services sector benefited from improvements in household spending, capital market and trade-related activities. Let me touch on private consumption. Private consumption expanded by 6.6% supported by continued employment and wage growth. Higher growth in private investment was driven by continued capital spending in the services and manufacturing sectors with additional lift from improvement in business sentiment. Improvement in business sentiment was on the account of a significant increase in manufacturing sales, particularly in electrical and electronics transport equipment and petroleum products. 
higher orders from both export and domestic markets, mainly for non-metallic products, textile and clothing, and also the expectation of better export sales and production, particularly in the heavy machinery and transport and electrical and electronics sectors. Let me touch on the inflation outlook. Headline inflation increased in first quarter of 2017 to 4.3%. This is within our earlier projection, as we have indicated during our last press conference. The high inflation was driven mainly by higher domestic fuel prices following the higher global oil prices after OPEC agreement to cut production. The price of RON95 rose by 29%. To average two ringgit and twenty-three cent in first quarter of two thousand and seventeen, from an average of one ringgit and seventy-three cent in the first quarter of two thousand and sixteen, higher inflation during the quarter was also driven by shortages in fresh food supplies amid adverse weather conditions and spillover of higher costs to prices of food away from home. It is important to note that the higher inflation rate was driven by cost rather than demand factors. Going forward, headline inflation is expected to moderate in the second quarter onwards. Saudari Saudari Sklian, in this report, we have included a box article entitled Inflation Perception versus Reality. There is a public skepticism on the CPI as the public perceive inflation to be higher than the actual CPI inflation. Public perception on inflation are in fact influenced by frequently purchased items such as food. These items typically experience higher inflation. However, households also spend on other items such as clothing which are in fact experiencing price declines. CPI inflation is a reflection of the overall price changes in the economy. It reflects average consumption patterns of the average Malaysian households and is a useful indicator in assessing macroeconomic conditions. Given this perception, we need the media assistance to educate the public on the concept of inflation and cost of living and the differences between them. In addition to the box article, recent infographic release on our Facebook page would also help in the dissemination and understanding on the subject matter. The external sector has been a key feature of the first quarter performance. The recovery in global trade since the fourth quarter of 2016 has gained further momentum. Gross exports recorded stronger growth of 21.4% in the first quarter of 2017. The improvement was broad-based across major products and markets, including both manufactured products such as E&E &E and commodity exports. Growth of gross imports was also higher at 27.7% on account of higher imports of intermediate goods and capital equipment. The capital imports were largely for investment in the export-oriented sectors, such as manufacturing, oil and gas, and aviation industries. These investments are expected to contribute to future exports. In view of the higher imports, the trade balance narrowed but remained in surplus during the quarter. Let's look at the current account of the balance of payment. It continued to record a surplus, albeit smaller at 5.3 billion ringgit or 1.7% of GNI. The surplus was supported by positive goods balance amid continued structural def deficits in services and income accounts. The smaller goods surplus reflected imports of high value investment equipment, including oil and gas vessels and aircraft. For 2017 as a whole, we expect the current account balance to remain in surplus of between 
1 to 2% of GNI. The ringgit, along with most major, major and regional currencies, have stabilized in 2017 amidst the broad weakening of the US dollar. As a result, the ringgit has appreciated by 4% against the US dollar as at 16 of May 2017. The weak US dollar sentiment was driven mainly by market uncertainty on the, di on the direction and implication of the current US administration policies. Following the announcement of the stability measures on 2nd of December and 13th of April 2017, the ringgit and domestic foreign exchange market have further improved. This is reflected in the improvements across all liquidity and volatility indicators of the foreign exchange market. Going forward, we should be mindful that external uncertainties could still result in higher exchange rate volatility. These external uncertainties include the US interest rate normalization, volatility in global oil prices, and global political development. Let's look at the domestic foreign exchange market. It has become more stable, reflected in improvement across all liquidity and volatility indicators of the foreign exchange market. Notably, the volatility of dollar ringgit has reduced significantly from 219 points to 70 points following introduction of stability measures. The adverse influence from the NDF market has subsided as evidenced by the narrowing of onshore offshore gap from 500 points to 300 points. Net conversion from trade has turned positive, reflective of Malaysia trade surplus. Cumulatively, between December 2016 and March 2017, exports conversion exceed imports by $1.4 billion. The positive impact is also reflected in Malaysia's credit default swap spread, which has been enrolled in recent months, following improved investors' confidence. At the end of March 2017, non-resident of Malaysian government bonds was lower at 24.7%. That figure was 30.6% as at the end of December 2016. The reduction of non-resident holding were primarily in the short-term papers with less than three years maturity. For the quarter, notable changes were observed for the asset management proportion of non-resident government bonds holding, recording a 7 percentage point decline to 35%. The reduction was mainly to the following reason. Large maturities of MGS for the quarter amounting to 19.3 billion ringgit. Non-resident held about 11 billion ringgit of these papers. And rebalancing of JP Morgan GPI EM index, which reduced nation way in the index as a result of inclusion of Argentina and exclusion of MGS maturing in less than a year, specifically in February and March 2017. The significant movement in non-resident capital flows reflect the deep integration of our domestic financial market with the rest of the world. Our domestic financial system remains resilient and significantly deep to intimidate these flows. In April, the trend above reversed. The Malaysian government bond market saw inflows across all tenors, amounting to 6 billion ringgit. Non-resident holding stood at 25.3% as at end of April 2017. As you have uh, known, the OPR was maintained at 3% at our most recent meeting in May. The MPC is cognizant of the recent positive growth development and will continue to assess the sustainability of this growth momentum. The current assessment remains that inflation is being driven by transitory cost factors. The MPC will monitor closely the degree of spillover of the higher cost to the broader price trend and overall demand conditions. Growth in net financing 
increased to 6.8 percent in the first quarter of 2017 during the period uh, under assessment. This was driven by the following an increase in both the growth in loans extended by the banking system and the, the development financial institution and the growth in net outstanding corporate bonds issued during the quarter. In particular, growth in outstanding business loan improved significantly to 7.1%, reflecting improvement in both SMEs and other businesses. Financing by banks and developmental financial institutions to SMEs maintain a robust annual growth of 9.2% to reach 300 billion ringgit as end of March 2017. SME financing comprises almost half of the total business financing by financial institution. Outstanding loan in under the scheme Perbiaan Micro intended for very small businesses grew by 5.9 percent to 940 million ringgit benefiting more than 66,000 micro enterprises. Domestic financial stability remained preserved. In the first quarter of 2017, asset quality of the banking system remained intact. The insurance and taka full sector also recorded higher profits amid more favorable financial market conditions. As such, the banking system and insurance industry remain well capitalized. Together, both sectors have access capital buffers exceeding 170 billion ringgit. The financial institution, therefore, remain in a strong position to respond to potential risks and challenges to financial stability. The liquidity in the banking system remains sufficient to support financing needs of the domestic economy. Domestic funding conditions were stable during the quarter. Average cost of deposit for banks stood at 2.55%, while the three-month climb remained stable at 3.43%. Banks currently maintain a high liquidity coverage ratio of 131% to meet unexpected cash outflows or adverse liquidity shocks. This is well above the regulatory requirements. All banks meet the 2017 minimum liquidity coverage ratio requirement of 80%. The loan to fund ratio, which better reflects banks' broader funding base of deposit and medium term instrument, stood at 82.8% at the end of the quarter. Let's look at the aggregate debt servicing capacity of mission business. It remained intact. The medium interest coverage ratio of listed firm improved to 11.8 times, which is significantly above the prudent threshold of two times. This was driven by export-oriented sectors amid higher commodity prices. The supply of credit to businesses was sustained. Total debt of businesses grew annually by 12.1% in the first quarter of 2017. This was driven by new funds raised in the domestic corporate bonds and the Sukuk market, which expanded by 10.3%. The oil and gas companies are expected to record better earnings in the second half of 2017. Risk to banking system remain limited, as exposures are small and about 5% of total exposures to all businesses. The annual growth of household debt continued to moderate to 5.2%. The quality of household debt portfolio remained intact with sign of further strengthening. Loan affordability assessment by lenders continued to improve. About 42% of borrowers with newly approved loans have debt service ratio of less than 40%. In addition, the share of borrowings by vulnerable borrowers reduced further. This now accounts for 21.9% of total household debt. Household delinquent and impact loans ratios therefore remain low and stable at 1.3% and 1.6% respectively. Another interesting article, box article in the new quarterly bulletin aimed to debunk the myth 
that measures to contain risk in the domestic property market have led to higher housing loan rejection. The overall housing loan approval rate remained high at 74.2% in the first quarter of 2017. The rate is the ratio of the number of housing loan applications approved by all banks to the number of housing loans applications received during the same period. In the first quarter, banks approved 22.3 billion ringgit of house, of house financing to 90,000 borrowers. More than 60% are, are for buyers of affordable housing units priced below 500,000 ringgit. At present, there are 2.3 million borrowers of housing loans. Of this, 72% are first-time owners of affordable houses. I have come to an end in sharing some of the key highlights in the quarterly bulletin. Our assessment is that the Malaysian economy is poised to register better performance. Growth will remain driven mainly by sustained domestic demand with additional support from improvement in export as global trade picks up. Malaysia's diversified economic structure, supported by sound macroeconomic fundamentals, continue to enable us to withstand challenges in the global and domestic environment. In the next presentation, allow me to provide some comments and inputs on current issues in the Malaysian economy and financial system. This is something new which we thought that we should share with the members of the media. The first issue relates to migration to PIN-based payment cards. To further enhance the security of payment and payment card transaction, the industry has embarked on an initiative to migrate the card holder's verification method from signature to PIN. As the end of April 2017, 100% of credit card and charge card and 96.1% of post-active debit cards has been replaced and 99.8% of point-of-sale terminals have been upgraded to support PIN. A six-month transition period has commenced since 1st January to 30th June this year to facilitate card holders and merchants to familiarize themselves with PIN usage. PIN will be made mandatory for all transactions on 1st of July 2017 and we need the media to help us to convey this message that no extension will be granted. Cardholders who have yet to replace their payment cards are urged to do so immediately by contacting their issuing banks. So we have about 60 more, about uh, 40 days more before that comes to effect. Cardholders who have received PIN-enabled cards should activate, select and use PIN for every transaction that they use. Merchants should facilitate and encourage PIN usage for every transaction to benefit from greater protection against fraud. The second issue is on regulatory capital framework. There has been some misconception over a recent policy announcement by the bank on the 3rd of May in regards to the removal of reserve fund requirements. Let me take this opportunity to clear the misconception. The reserve fund is a prudential tool for banks that can be used during period of stress. In the past, banks were required to set aside a percentage of their profits into reserve fund before distributing their dividends. With the latest Basel III Capital Adequacy Framework, the reserve fund is no longer relevant and it has been replaced by the Basel III capital buffer requirements. Both requirements serve the same purpose. Effectively, banks are still required to maintain buffers and there is no change in policy direction. As banks are still expected to maintain buffers, we do not expect to see a significant increase in dividend payout. Moving on to concern on illegal financial scheme in Malaysia. The existence of this scheme are also encouraged by the participation of the public, driven by the sense of greed and misplaced confidence. 
the public stops participating in the scheme today, the illegal scheme will eventually close down. Based on our observation, there are groups of investors who actively look for not regulated investment with unrealistic promise of return and jump from one scheme to another to enjoy the benefit of being the early birds before it collapses. There are also investors who knowingly take the risk and are willing to proceed with the illegal investment with a proper and legitimate document, despite the fact that the entity has been listed by the authority. For this group of investors, action will be taken under the law for abatement and dealing with illegal proceeds. Financial institutions and money service business providers have enhanced their vigilance as financial gatekeepers to deter the institution from being abused for facilitation of illegal financial activities. Apart from aiming at deceiving reckless investors, this is also aimed at creating overlapping jurisdiction of offences to complicate investigation and prosecution process. Based on the current Joint Enforcement Initiative, the relevant law enforcement agencies who will also assess the current legal framework and they need to have more unified approach at national level to combat illegal financial schemes. This will be continued and enhanced. For this purpose, close, close collaboration will be fostered among authorities, consumer associations and the NGOs. <coughs> Moving forward, awareness and education program for members of the public will continue to be our focus and priorities. This will be further strengthened through joint initiative by all the relevant agencies. I have come to the end of the presentation.